Hi, Chris, Chapman the Cap Motor Legends. Today I'm going to try to answer a question that again is often asked on the internet, and that question is, what is the best motorcycle helmet? Who makes the best motorcycle helmet? Now, obviously I understand the question, I understand why people might want to ask that question, but in its own right, it's a little bit simplistic, it's perhaps a little bit broad. It's like asking who makes the best bike. Ask 10 people, you'll probably get 11 different answers. The best helmet depends on what you're looking for, what is best. So for some people, that'll be the safest helmet. For others, it'll be the quietest helmet, the most reliable, the most versatile, perhaps, the most comfortable. And then we have to look at whether, oh, the kind of helmet that we are rating in that there are open face helmets, full face helmets, flips, adventure helmets, race helmets, off-road helmets. And one has to acknowledge that one man's meat is another man's poison. So I'm a particular fan of flip lids, but if I came out and said, this flip lid is the best helmet on the market, someone else might not rate flip lids at all. So there's gonna be no universal panacea here. I cannot come up with a helmet that's gonna sue everybody. There's another truth here, which is that the best helmet in the world, whatever that is, it's not gonna work on you if it doesn't fit you. So I am gonna end this review today with a helmet that I think is the best helmet in the world. But if it doesn't fit your head, it's gonna be useless. It just won't work for, for you. And that's because all brands of helmet have a different internal shape. We also, as riders, we all have differently shaped heads. So we've looked at these two guys before. Technically, these are both the same measurement. So let's say they're a 58 measurement, Mr. Roundhead, Mr. Oval Head. The helmet that fits this guy well is not gonna fit this guy at all well because his helmet is gonna be a round shape when Mr. Ovalhead puts it on, it's gonna be very tight at the front and back of the head. When this guy puts on the helmet that fits, when Mr. Roundhead puts on the helmet that fits Mr. Oval guy, then that helmet's gonna be far too tight at the sides, and it's gonna be long at the front and back. What a lot of people do, they take the measurement with the tape measure, come up with the fact that say they're a 58 and then assume that they can just order a 58 online. It just does not work like that, as we've seen. And then of course, that's in the horizontal plane, there's then a vertical plane because our heads, which go up into the helmet, they're not all the same shape. Some are kind of dome shaped, some are sharper shaped. So it's quite a challenge to find a helmet that works exactly for you. And then there's one other factor, which is face shape. Now, this guy's got what we might call a pear drop face. This guy's a little bit fuller in the face. And anyone who thinks that you can take a helmet and it's gonna fit all these people with different shaped heads, different shaped faces. They just don't understand how helmets work and how helmets fit. Nevertheless, despite all these reservations and caveats, I think we're up to answering the question, who makes the best motorcycle helmet? As suggested, there are lots of criteria that can be applied to this holy grail of quest, the quest for the best motorcycle helmet. But we would be bold and suggest that when most people ask, who makes the best helmet? What they're actually asking is who makes the safest motorcycle helmet? Because protection obviously sits at the heart of motorcycle helmets. The primary function of a motorcycle helmet is not, funny enough, to match the color scheme of your bike and its paintwork, it's to protect your head. So before we progress and talk about this in a little bit more depth, I want to put to bed a few urban myths. And one of these is that all helmets are tested to the same standard. That standard is known as EC2205, therefore, all helmets have got to be the same. I'm afraid that's not at all the case. It's a bit like saying that because all motorcycle riders have passed the same test, we all drive to the same level of competence on the road, and clearly that's nonsense. 2205 is a very minimum standard. It is not, in our view, particularly demanding. There's a new standard coming through now, 2206, which is more demanding, but it's a fairly low level. And what we know, because we discussed it, at length in previous videos is that you can buy a helmet from Lidl, from the supermarket Lidl, for 25 pounds that technically passes 2205. But there is a huge difference in the protective qualities of helmets that just get over the finishing line, as it were, that just meet the standard, and those that pass easily. One of the problems is that once you've had a helmet tested, you send your prototype in, it gets tested, you come, it comes back and you're told it passes 2205, no further retesting is required. And some of the factories in China and other parts of the world, that's it. Nobody knows whether they are cutting corners, losing thinner EPSs, thinner shells, or whatever. So it is absolutely not the case to imagine that all helmets are the same. Also, the premium brands 
test their helmets continuously. So a company like Arai or Shui or Shubath, I don't know the numbers, but every 500 helmets that come off the production line or 100 helmets, they pull one off and they test that helmet against the standard. And if it fails, they will destroy the entire batch. The other thing, of course, is that these brands, the premium brands, don't test to meet 2205 because a lot of them are involved in motorsport, in MotoGP and so on. They are testing anyway to a much higher standard than 2205. So the suggestion that all helmets are the same because they're 2205 is, I'm afraid, just nonsense. The cheapest form of motorcycle helmet construction in terms of the shell is what we call polycarbonate. And basically, that's a fancy name for plastic. Plastic helmets pass the test. In fact, in some ways, they pass the test quite easily because they're quite pliable often. But when you have a polycarbonate shell, it's a soft shell, the problem with them is that they can crack on repeated impacts. And the test, the 2205 test, didn't test particularly well in this area. So you'll have an accident, the helmet will absorb the energy, but the shell will crack. If you have a second impact for whatever reason, then you're not going to be that protected. One up from polycarbonate helmets are fiberglass helmets. They are better, they are stronger, but they're still not from what one would call the top drawer. I think it would be not unfair to suggest that the best, most protective helmets on the market are made from what we call composite shells. Now, there's a huge range of technologies and initials and patented systems that are used by the different manufacturers, but a composite shell is basically fiberglass interwoven with something like Kevlar or carbon with sheets or strands, something like that. So it's a fiberglass base, but then they strengthen it with something much stronger than fiberglass. Leads us to ask the question, how about carbon? Because carbon's got to be the best of the lot because MotoGP riders ride in carbon helmets. Well, I'm afraid not. Carbon is lighter than composite materials or fiberglass, but it's not necessarily stronger. The reason that MotoGP riders and racers ride in carbon helmets is because it is lighter. Lighter in the context of racing means more speed, lose weight, gain speed. Also, when you're a rider in MotoGP or you're riding around a track at great speed, there's a lot of G-forces on the neck and having a lighter helmet makes those G-forces less draining, as it were. So that's why racers prefer carbon helmets is not to do necessarily with the, safe, with the safety aspect. As a road rider, there are a number of reasons why you might want to ride in a carbon helmet. You may have a carbon fetish, you may just like the way it looks. You may want a helmet that matches all those body panels that you put on your bike. You may feel that you ride so hard that you're creating those G-forces on your neck and therefore carbon's gonna be better for you. In truth, I would suggest not, but up to you. But if you think that you are buying into a carbon helmet because it's safer, I'm sorry, that's not the case. There was another urban myth that I wanted to dispel, to dispel, and it's that you can choose a helmet or you can buy a better helmet based on its sharp rating. Some hold the sharp system dearly because it makes decision-making e easier. It takes the decision out of their hands. They just look on the sharp website, a four star has got to be better than a three star, a five star than a four star and so on. And if you're the kind of person who only eats in a restaurant based on its Trustpilot review, or its TripAdvisor review, then by all means, go ahead and buy a five-star helmet. But for various reasons, nobody or very few people in the motorcycle industry take the Sharp standard at all seriously. In fact, there's only one brand, one helmet manufacturer that does take it seriously, and that's because coincidentally, the construction of their helmets happens to work well on the Sharp test. Now, Sharp was formed when the UK went into the EU. And what happened then, there were loads of guys who had been doing the UK testing under the BSI mark, the British Standards Institute. And when we went into the EU, those guys had some spare testing equipment, lots of white lab coats, but nothing really to do, no jobs. So they lobbied the government to create a new system. And in doing this, they cited a European Commission report called COS 327. And they came up with this methodology that they would take 2205, which was going to be the European standard, and then they could say, this is better, this is better still, and so on. But there was a problem. When Sharp came to implement COS 327, they cut corners. They used cheap steel head forms rather than the 
more sophisticated, much more expensive biometric headforms that COS327 had demanded. When Sharp came out with their very first round of tests, they awarded five stars to a laser helmet. It's a 60 pound laser helmet. In that same round of tests, they gave three stars to an Arai helmet. And everyone realized, clearly that's nonsense. This isn't working. And thereafter, nobody in this business has really taken Sharp particularly seriously. So if you buy your helmet based on a Sharp rating, go ahead. But you will not be getting necessarily what you think you're getting. There are probably maximum a couple of dozen of what I would call serious players in the motorcycle helmet market, serious technical players. I'm going to ignore, for the purposes of this particular quest, I'm going to ignore the real cheapy brands that you find in scooter shops and discount emporiums because, let's face it, no one is seriously going to think that anyone who sells a £100 or a £200 helmet is going to be a contender for the best helmet in the world. The pool, as far as I'm concerned, contains brands like AGV, RI, Bell, Kberg, HJC, Laser, LS2, Nex, Nolan, Premier, Roof, Scorpion, Shark, Exolite, Shubath, and Shui. Now, I apologize if I've missed some key names there. I may well have done. That's not intended as a slur, but for me and this exercise, it's not a problem really because I know who the winner of this is and I know that the winner is on that list. I also don't want to get into a debate really with people about whether a Nolan is better than an HJC or a laser is better than an LS2. The truth is it's nearly impossible, even for us, even for someone in the trade, to know that. Now I've visited loads of helmet factories and I've sat opposite people who have tried to convince me that they make the best helmets and they've talked about their quality control systems being better than other people, how their testing is more rigorous, that they test to a higher standard. They talk about things like MIPS, They've got softer shells, so they've got harder shells, they've got multi-layer EPSs, they've got patented technologies, they've got experience in MotoGP. All I would say is all of the names that I've mentioned who are in that group of about 20, maybe 24 serious helmets, there are two brands that, in our view, stand out from the crowd. And I don't think that most serious motorcyclists, certainly no one working in this industry, but people who really know their onions, no one's going to argue with those. Those who are associated with other brands, other than these two brands, would perhaps protest, but my feeling is they might be protesting too much. So as I've said, I think there are only two genuine candidates for the title, who makes the best helmet, and predictably for those who work in motorcycling, those candidates are, of course, Arai and Shui. They've both been producing motorcycle helmets since the 1950s. In the case of Arai, since the early part of that decade, Shui came on board a little bit later that decade. They both test these days to a standard that is way beyond 2205. Indeed, in some respects, they're testing beyond 2206. And as you would expect from Japanese companies, their quality control systems, the procedures that they use for making sure that their helmets meet the standard are in a different league to any other manufacturers. They are technically from the top draw with features like, as we know here, changeable cheek pads, changeable headliners. They're obsessed with getting the fit right. And in our view, you can't be a serious player. You can't be a contender for an award of the best helmet on the market if you can't offer the customer the ability to get a perfect customized fit. Both companies have also been in the top echelons of motorsport for some 50 years. Now, we are not necessarily fans of those manufacturers who use motorsport, motorsport as a route to fame and success. It's a well-worn, quick, easy, albeit expensive way to the top. And I think it's dangerous to choose your helmet based on the fact that you've seen it on the head of a famous rider. So, for example, Valentino Rossi. We have to ask ourselves, is Valentino Rossi wearing an AGV helmet? I say is. Was he wearing an AGV helmet because he thought that was the very best, safest helmet? Or was he wearing an AGV because they offered him a huge check? In truth, you don't have to be Einstein to work it out. Now, Arai and Shui, both very much involved in motorsport. As I've mentioned, they've been involved since the 60s. And I'm sure, in fact, I know they pay their riders. But both have been involved in motorsport from the early 60s. They have been instrumental in pushing safety as a way of protecting their riders. And no 
two companies have done more to define the modern helmet than these two stalwarts of the business. They were also, let's remember, the first companies, and I think this is an indicator, the first companies to come out with helmets that were accredited to the new 2206 level. And that's partly because both companies were very much involved in the latest FIM standard, FIM standard that came in in 2018. Now, FIM, that FIM standard really shaped 2206, and both Shui and Arai were very instrumental in shaping that standard. As a little aside, but to me, again, it's an indicator that when that standard came in in 2018, not every helmet manufacturer could meet the standard. And there were a number of helmet manufacturers who, during that season, their riders had Shui and Arai helmets on, but with different logos. And I think that tells us a lot. Let's talk first about Arai. As a company, Arai is totally uncompromising, ruled as it is by the iron rod that is Monsieur Arai, the son of the founder. Arai as a company tend to lock down their noses at pretty much every other helmet manufacturer, even it has to be said at Shui, because in Arai's book, every other brand has been prepared to make sacrifices on safety in pursuit of commercial objectives. That doesn't happen at Arai, but Arai's safety is everything. And I think they're not wrong because every maker talks about or talks the same rhetoric, as it were. And I've sat in front of a number of these manufacturers and they all talk, talk, talk about how safety sits at the heart of everything they do. But reality is that commercial considerations do at some times, do at times take precedence because perhaps there's a need to hit a price point. They want to have a helmet that comes in at 250 pounds. And our eyes view would be, and one has to agree, if you're going to bring in a helmet that's 250 pounds, 200 pounds, you're not prioritizing safety. You're prioritizing commercial objectives. Maybe these helmet manufacturers need to achieve volumes, preserve margins, but the reality is, the bottom line is that most helmet manufacturers talk the talk of safety. They don't necessarily mock, they don't necessarily, excuse me, they don't necessarily walk the walk. And that might explain why Arai helmets are more expensive, because they are not chasing volume. Their helmets are not inexpensive. There will never be a 200 pound Arai or a 100 pound Arai. A, an Arai helmet is a piece of safety headwear and it costs what it costs. Now, of course, for Arai, safety is always in the context of racing. And what motivates Arai as a company is protecting its riders. That's runs through the entire philosophy of Arai. Now, in the 70s, they developed this conviction that this, the best shape for a motorcycle helmet, for the shell, the shell of a motorcycle helmet, was a very smooth, round dome. The eggshell shape is, in its own right, very strong. But there was another advantage to having a smooth, round dome, and that is if a rider went down and hit the ground, particularly on a race circuit at speed, they didn't want a helmet to dig in because if a helmet digs in, it will rotate the head and that can cause twisting of the brain inside the skull. That can cause brain damage. It's a concept that RI has called, and they've called it this for many years, glancing off. However, in the years that have intervened in the 80s and 90s and even to the modern era, lots of helmet manufacturers have pursued a slightly different look with helmets with sharp edges and angles in pursuit perhaps of some degree of fashionability, but not to Arai. Arai will not change their fundamental principles. What's interesting in the context of glancing off is that the new standard 2206 kind of recognizes that Arai was right all along because in the new test, there is for the first time an angled impact test. In 2205, it was just a direct impact test, but now there's an angle impact for that same reason that 2206 now recognizes or the ECE now recognizes that a twisting helmet can cause a brain damage. New helmets, I believe, that are going to come on from here will, I think, start to be rounder for this very reason, because it's going to be easier for helmet manufacturers to pass the 2206 if they've got a rounder shell. So again, this kind of shows us that RI were always ahead of the game. They knew what they were talking about. Everyone ignored them, but actually they were right. And Arai is just one of those companies. They are driven by fundamental principles and they will not change it. You will not, because of their racing philosophy and their in-house views, you will never find a flip lid Arai helmet. You won't even find an Arai helmet with a drop down sun visor because again, they feel that that compromises in some way safety. Nor will you get an integrated comm system. And Arai takes this view 
I'm assuming that they know that they are causing damage to themselves commercially because the fastest growing sector in the helmet market is flip lid helmets and they don't have any offering there. Most riders, a lot of riders, except for pure sports bike riders, a lot of riders demand a drop down sun visor. It would be so easy for our riders to put a drop down sun visor in their hel helmets, but they won't do it because it's a fundamental principle. And they do all of this, they maintain this philosophy based on racing, despite the fact that what we know is the sports bike is kind of dying. And I think this shows that one has to admire what RI is, the kind of company that they are. They are truly being motivated and driven by concerns of safety. So in conclusion, there's no doubt in our opinion, in my opinion, that RI make the best quality, safest helmets that money can buy. There are few companies that are so driven, so driven by fundamental principles that are so monotheistic in terms of safety. Let me sum it up. If I were to open the paper, read my horoscope, and it said that tomorrow I'm gonna to be going up to Donington Park, I'm gonna be doing a track day at Donington Park, and I'm gonna come off and I'm gonna bang my head, I have to say the helmet that I would most want to wear would probably be an RI, it would certainly be an RI, probably the latest Quantic. But there is a question. Having said that, having said that they are fabulous helmets, super safe, are they too uncompromising for the road rider? And to answer this, I'm gonna go back over some elements of RI's history. When RI were first exporting helmets to America in the late 60s, they were one of the first helmets to be tested and they tested to a standard, a car testing standard called Snell. And that's still, even these days, an impressive standard, in some ways better than 2205, in some respects, maybe even better than 2206. But that standard was developed for car racing. And helmets in car racing have a different job to do to helmets in motorcycle racing. A car helmet has to be able to withstand multiple impacts. So if you roll over, your head's gonna bang, bang, bang against the roll cage. So that was why the Snell standard set up a preference for a particularly tough outer shell. Now, RI adopted this early on, and that, even though RI, RI obviously is still in car racing, but even in motorcycle racing, RI still have that extra thick outer shell as part of their philosophy. And that's good in that if you have a helmet with a thick shell, if you do hit your head hard, and then for whatever reason there's a second impact, a thicker shell is not going to crack, and a helmet that has cracked is not going to protect you in the way it should do. So a thick shell on one level in multi-impact scenarios are better. But thick shells don't dissipate energy and absorb energy in the, may, in the way that you might want to. And of course the main role, one of the key roles of a helmet is to absorb energy to stop the brain flying across the skull and so on. So what happens with our eyes, because they have this extra thick shell, a thicker shell than any other manufacturer, they have to have a really thick EPS. Now, here's a helmet that our eyes sent us to demonstrate this. I was, I admit, quite stickled pink. They sent this helmet to us and they actually put a sticker on in case we uh, didn't understand it. But this helmet, this helmet has a sticker on that says, do not use for display purposes only. Um, I think well, we might have guessed that. But what we see here, we've got this thicker shell. I've seen lots of other helmets. This is a much thicker shell than most helmets. And then we've got this super thick EPS. So that's all well and good. This strong outer shell doesn't absorb energy, but to compensate for that, we have a thicker EPS. Fine. But the result of that is that our eye helmets tend to be bigger and heavier than other helmets, and not everyone wants that. For example, if we look at the latest 2206 helmets, if I compare the NXR2 compared with the Quantec in size small, the NXR2 weighs 1265 grams, the Ally Quantic weighs 1,600 grams. Now that's not a huge amount. That's about, from when I was a kid, that was a bag of wine gums. But in helmet years, as it were, that's still quite an amount. The other thing that comes out of Ally's racing background is ventilation. If you are creating helmets for racers, racers need a large amount of ventilation because they are using a lot of energy, they're flying around at speed, they're gonna get very hot. And the way that you cool a rider down so they can concentrate on the job in hand is to provide lots of ventilation. So our eyes have always had a lot of ventilation. And that's great if you're on the circuit. But the problem is that ventilation 
can also be seen as noise because if you've got a lot of air coming in, then when that air reaches the ears, that translates as noise. So the downside of our eyes is that they are also a little bit noisy. So whereas obviously our eye have got a wind tunnel at their factory, when they go in the wind tunnel, they are not testing for the amount of noise that a helmet generates in the way that someone like Subath is. They are testing for drag and lift. For them, noise is not that important. Racers wear earplugs. Noise is not a key consideration for our eye. Our eyes, therefore, are a little bit noisy. So, conclusion. Our eyes are amazing. I think they are just the best helmet. But if you buy into an eye, you have to accept some trade-offs. They are big, they are heavy, and they are noisy, and you're not going to get many of those mod cons that a lot of us have got used to having integrated comms, drop-down sun visors, flip-up lids, and so on. So that's it. If you don't need any of those, and if you're prepared to live with the downsides that come with our eye, then our eye's the helmet for you. Problem is that for many riders these days, the mod cons that we're talking about are not just nice to have features. So for example, if you're someone who commutes daily and you go from west to east into the sun in the morning and in the evening you go east to west and you've got the sun in your eyes again, a sun visor is not just something that might be nice to have, it's almost a mandatory. If you do lots of miles, if you are a big mileage commuter or you go touring, you might well appreciate of the convenience of a flip lid, which you can push up, get a bit of cool air in and so on. You might also appreciate the extra quiet that you get from a helmet from someone like Shui. If you ride with friends, you might appreciate the ability to have integrated comms. Integrated comms are safer, so it's nice to have integrated comms in the helmet. So this brings me to my overall conclusion. Shui and Arai make the best helmets on the market. I think they sit head and shoulders above everyone else I don't think there can be much debate about it. Our eye gets the laurels in terms of safety and probably even in terms of quality. And if you're looking for a helmet for track days, let's say you've got a sports bike and you want something that's appropriate to a sports bike, then I think an eye is gonna be the helmet for you. But if you're a road rider, someone like me, then I think a Shui comes into the fore. If you want superb protection, because a Shui is still a very protective helmet, but you want conveniences, the kind of things that we've discussed about that are going to that we've discussed they're going to make riding more relaxing more enjoyable then shui probably gets the vote our eyes are amazing helmets but in truth if i was to be harsh they are really just thinly disguised race helmets shui is more open to compromise they are still a very safe helmet as i mentioned but i think shui understands the demands of the road rider and that's why we think that for the majority of motorcyclists Shoei is actually the best helmet. Let me put it like this. I was talking about that horoscope that I read the other day. If I woke up, read my horoscope, tomorrow I was going to do a track day at Donington. I was going to have an accident. Donington's three hours away from me. If I was going to have to ride up there and do that track day, I would wear an Arai when I got to the circuit, but for getting to Donington and back, I'm sorry, I'd wear a Shoei. If you'd like to see the range of motorcycle helmets we do offer, then go over to the website motorlegends.com. Once you're there, once you're on a helmet page, you can check out what the spec of a particular helmet is, what the availability is, and obviously, if you want, you can buy one there and then. Now, when you buy from us, we try to make the process as simple, straightforward, and risk-free as we possibly can. There's no delivery charge on any item of protected way that you buy from us. Returns are totally free, and what's more, we give you a full 12 months in which to decide whether you do want to return something to us. We have the best price guarantee in the motorcycle business. Now, John Lewis is rightly famed for it's never knownly undersold price promise, but we go one better than John Lewis in that if you can find anyone selling anything at a price that is cheaper than ours, then we will beat that competitor's price by a full 10%. Now, there are a few terms and conditions attached to what we call our price beat, but if you are going to price beat, I suggest you go over to the website and check out what those terms and conditions are. If in the, in the future you'd like to receive bulletins from us about new products and product launches, then go to the website. There's a piece of script at the top of the page, newsletter sign up, click on there. Within seconds, you'll be in business. If, however, you prefer to get your information videographically, that is to say, in this form, we'd be simply delighted if you wanted to become a subscriber to our YouTube channel. Now, this year is 2021. Last year, 2020, we gave away to a YouTube subscriber a Mutt 125cc motorcycle. We had customized it a little bit to make it look like a Steve McQueen desert sled. This year, 2021, we are giving away, we've got a little bit up market, we're giving away a 250cc Fantic Caballero Scrambler, but we're not giving it away to a 
YouTube subscriber, rather we're giving it away to somebody who follows us on Facebook. So if you want to stand a chance of winning this bike and we're giving it away just before Christmas this year, 2021, then go over to Facebook and obviously follow us. I'd like to finish with a play for our little shop here at Moto Legends. The shop is based about a mile from the centre of Guildford, a mile from the railway station. It's got a small footprint, but it's attached to our warehouse where we have more than £2 million worth of stock arranged over three floors. Technically, that makes us the second largest motorcycle apparel shop in the UK. But we think that we are far more than just the amount of merchandise we have here in the building. We're all about service and personal fitting. If you want to check us out, visit Trustpilot. We have the highest five-star ranking in motorcycling. When you come and see us, we'll serve you only the finest Italian Italy coffee, or we'll serve you proper Yorkshire tea in a proper teapot. And who knows, if you're lucky, you might even get to some one of our delicious motorcycle-shaped shortbread biscuits. Anyway, this has been Chris. I hope to talk to you again soon.